At the weekend, Manchester City won an unprecedented domestic treble in emphatic style, thrashing Watford by a joint record six goal margin, something which hadn't been done since Barry beat Derby County by the same 6 0 scoreline some 116 years ago. On the face of it, it's an extraordinary achievement. The Sky Blues have now won six trophies in two seasons, amassing 198 points in the Premier League table, all while playing a brand of football so ambitious, many said it couldn't be done in England when Pep Guardiola first turned up at the Etihad. A valid argument could be made for this Man City side being the finest we've ever seen in the English game. Following their history making on Saturday afternoon though, as part of an angle that seems to have been prominent in large parts of the press for much of this season, that wasn't the story a lot of journalists in England went with as their coverage of this game. The most notable, and indeed the most damning, came from the Independent's chief football writer, Miguel Delaney, but he certainly isn't alone. The often excellent Jonathan Wilson and David Conn, the latter of whom has been one of the best football writers in Britain for a long time, also wanted to talk about finances the second the referee had blown his final whistle, more so than the historic achievement. Now, I have no dog in this fight. I don't support Man City, nor any of their rivals locally or competitively, nor do I have any affinity with either side of the argument. From the perspective of Man City fans, it would seem as though their team gets a really rough ride from the press. To them, perhaps, it's because they've been the so-called new boys challenging the media darlings like Manchester United and Liverpool. Those within the media could equally argue that City's UEFA investigation for potential breaches of financial fair play is a major story that they have to cover, and the fact that other teams' fans are really starting to call Man City spending into question as their success on the pitch increases, it is fair game for them to write about it and call it how they see it. Both are perfectly reasonable viewpoints. As a neutral, the difference between the coverage of Liverpool's success and failures in comparison to the coverage of Man City's is borderline laughable, whether that's in the written press or from a TV studio packed full of former Anfield favourites. Likewise, if, and it remains an if at this stage, Manchester City are in breach of FFP regulations, whilst you could argue many teams have looked to get around those rules, they would nevertheless have broken the rules, gained an unfair advantage and be due some kind of punishment. Some criticisms of Man City do ring a little hollow though. On Saturday, Delaney tweeted, City have been used as a vassal for some projects that could have gone anywhere, which may well be true, but is there anything new there? We all know how close Roman Abramovich supposedly came to buying Tottenham rather than Chelsea back in 2003, and is there any reason to believe his 1 billion plus funding of the Blues wouldn't have brought similar levels of success to White Hart Lane, or anywhere else for that matter? It seems to me that whether there is anything new or unique about the Man City project is the real crux of the argument. You'll often hear fans say things like Man City have ruined the game, but have they really? Spending in football has been increasing at an incredible rate ever since the dawn of time, and that increase has been accelerated further since the birth of the Premier League in 1992. Manchester United spending £30 million on Rio Ferdinand in 2002 and over £28 million on Juan Sebastian Braun in 2001 look like much more regular fees in the summers that they occurred than any business done by Man City. Has Man City spending since the arrival of Sheikh Mansour been any more of a game changer than the spending of Roman Abramovich when he first arrived at Chelsea? The suggestion seems to be that yes, it has, but I'm yet to be convinced. Sure, the numbers have gone up, but that happens in every generation. Mansour's early outlay dwarfs Abramovich's in the same way Abramovich's early outlay dwarfed that of Jack Walker's at Blackburn Rovers, and just in the same way Walker's did the most ambitious owners and chairman before him, and quite possibly in just the same way the next filthy rich owner in English football will do to Mansour. That isn't to say any of it is right. In one of my final English exams when I was at school, my coursework was a piece entitled Is Money Ruining Our Beautiful Game? with the S in is, very cleverly swapped for a dollar sign. I was a smart kid. That write-up was all about the incredible wealth inequality in football, how a lack of competitiveness in the game could crush the lower leagues and bring about the downfall of the game in England. In the many, many years since, the wealth inequality has increased in English football, the competitiveness has taken a further blow, and yet support for the game, both in Premier League grounds and on TV, remains undamaged. Those are still valid concerns, more valid if anything, and it is a problem Man City are very much a part of, 
but no more so than their fellow big hitters, and indeed less so than the various governing bodies of FIFA, UEFA, the FA, and the Premier League. Likewise, lecturing on human rights abuses by the United Arab Emirates seems more than a little disingenuous. Whilst these abuses absolutely ought to be covered, and covered a great deal more I might add, they should never be weaponised against supporters of a football club who have as much to do with them as you or I. At a certain point, it begins to look like mudslinging, and a case of just trying to hit Man City with whatever ammunition there may be. There are undoubtedly great benefits to Manchester City's wealth as well. The training ground and youth setup they have built is quite possibly the finest in the world, and can only be a net positive for the English game. Although still in its infancy, the national team has already benefited from graduates like Jadon Sancho and Phil Foden, two of the most exciting and in many ways un-English young talents the country has seen in a long, long time. The significance of Pep Guardiola's arrival in English football in relation to the fact that it has coincided with England's surprising best place finish at a World Cup in 28 years is up for debate. What is not, I would argue, is the success of the Spanish national team whilst Pep was manager at Barcelona and the German national team during Pep's time at Bayern Munich. If you acknowledge that those two are inextricably linked, and personally, I think you'd be mad not to, then it's not unreasonable to think England, given the way Man City are playing, could be experiencing a similar benefit. Of course, the likes of Jurgen Klopp and Maurizio Pochettino, in particular, are also contributing on that front, but it seems to be Pep's idealism and relentlessness on the training ground which really sets the tone. If we accept that this is the way football is, and I do think it's a crying shame in many respects, that we have free spending foreign owners with little historical emotional attachment to clubs, and the ones who spend the most tend to get the best results, and let's not pretend that started at Man City, then are Man City the best of a bad situation? This is a club which hasn't tried to erase any of Man City's history, has invested heavily in youth development, and plays a wonderful brand of football. What's more, the Etihad employs a sensible and thoroughly reasonable pricing policy in comparison to Man City's rivals, and they seem to operate as a club that genuinely cares about how their supporters feel. Whilst I would love the English footballing pyramid to be a rich tapestry of competitive clubs who don't lose their star players after a season or two of good form, where it's still possible for a club like Stoke City to hold on to one of the best players in the world, or for a manager to take over a team at the foot of the second division and have won back-to-back -back European Cups within the next five years, I'm well aware that those days are gone and will probably never return. So in a world where you could ask 100 football fans to predict the Premier League's top six before a ball has even been kicked, and 99 of them will pick the right six, if not necessarily the right order, at least Man City are a team with footballing ideals. Love them or loathe them, I'm not sure you're even a football fan if you can't sit back and marvel at Edison's composure, Bernardo Silva's energy and invention, David Silva's reading of the game, Raheem Sterling's near week-on-week -week improvements, Sergio Aguero's explosive finishing, and Kevin De Bruyne's all-round genius. This team is special, regardless of how it was assembled or how much money has been spent on it, and there's no team I've enjoyed watching in European football over the last two or three years more than them. When Miguel Delaney writes, this is the foreseeable future of football though, it is a problem. He's dead right, but I'm not sure where he's been for the last 15 to 20 years. This has been the past, present and future of football for a long, long time. So you may direct your ire at Man City, and they ought to be punished if they've broken the rules. But this is a systematic and endemic problem with football that is in no way exclusive to the blue side of Manchester. Delaney polarised Man City's billions, with Bolton Wanderers staff having to use food banks, which again, is a valid, albeit far from new concern. More importantly though, it is not a fault of Man City's, but once more a fault of football. If we are to seriously change the game for the good, and overhaul it in a way which would lead to increased competitiveness, which seems as impossible as it is implausible right now, those changes have to come from FIFA, UEFA, the FA, the Premier League, the EFL, and so on. They have moulded the sport into what it is today, not the latest, in a long line of wildly wealthy owners from thousands of miles away. That's it for today's video. As I say, I have no attachment to Man City nor their rivals, so I like to think I have a pretty impartial take on things, although that doesn't necessarily mean I'm right of course. I know there are some Man City fans who desperately miss the pre-Mansour days and Main Road era, so we'd love to hear from you in the comments. Likewise, rival supporters, 
If you can take off your partisan goggles just for a second, what do you think of City spending? Is it really any different to what Abramovich did at Chelsea and arguably even Ferguson at one stage at Manchester United? Can you honestly say they are ruining the game rather than a more endemic problem within the game? Let us know below, thanks for watching, and make sure you're subscribed to HITC7s and have notifications turned on for the channel. You don't have to watch all our videos, but that way you'll at least see when we've new ones up.